Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. It's James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Today is the 7th of May, 2014, and today we're joined on the line by a frequent guest here on the program, although it's been a while since he has been on. I'm talking about Rick Rosoff of Stop NATO International at rickrosoff.wordpress.com. That will, of course, be linked up in the con- in the show notes for today's conversation. And for people who are interested in our previous conversations, we've talked five times in the past by my count, and those conversations can be found simply by typing Rick Rosoff into the search bar on CorbettReport.com so you can listen to some of our previous conversations, which unfortunately seem as well as relevant today as they did at the time they were recorded. Of course, we are speaking in May of 2014, so we are looking at what's happening in Eastern Europe with shock, awe, and horror at the potentials, uh, the potential outcome of what could happen here, as the world is poised really on a knife edge. And although no one wants to see war happen other than the psychopaths, unfortunately, they tend to be the ones in the position of power to make that happen. So I think we are right to be concerned about what we see happening. So Rick, it is great to have you here on the program once again, and I'd like to draw on your knowledge of NATO and what's been happening in the time since our previous conversation to talk about that uh, that that phenomenon that we've been documenting here in our previous conversations of NATO expansionism. Our last conversation specifically on the topic of global expansion of this North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the increasingly inaccurately named NATO and I see on the front page of uh, Stop NATO International right now, new axis, NATO Japan, deep in partnership, discuss Ukraine. So this truly is a global organization at this point. Perhaps you can bring us up to speed on some of the latest developments regarding the expansion of NATO. Well, thank you for having me back for the fifth time. And incidentally, and I hope your um, listeners appreciate as much as I do, that is as splendid uh, a lead-in as I've ever heard, truthfully. I mean, it's, it's literally scintillating with insights, and uh, I'll try my, be- my best to follow up on as many of them as I can uh, can do. Uh, the fact that, yeah, the, you're correct, the anything but North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and we've had, I think, occasion to discuss this aspect of it in the past, but 65 years ago, this April 4th, when NATO was founded, it had some right to that title, that moniker, as uh, of the 12 nations that founded uh, NATO initially, uh, you know, uh, every one of them except for Italy, uh, arguably either border the North Atlantic Ocean or some sea adjoining it. Uh, we should also mention, by the way, you know, for people who uh, don't aren't aware of this, a majority of those 12 countries are and remain constitutional monarchies. Uh, that is seven of the five. Uh, so when they talk about Euro-Atlantic values uh, in some manner, um, including democracy or representative government or popular, I don't think they even use the word popular, to be frank with you. It would be too glaring a lie. Uh, we should also keep in mind this is a very elite club in every sense of the word elite. Uh, it's difficult to join. They're uh, very... Um, uh, draconian preconditions and uh, the people running it are, uh, you know, oftentimes members of royalty as George Robertson, for example, former Secretary General of NATO's, uh, you know, Lord Robertson of Port Ellen, uh, like the Baroness Ashton in the European Union. So we're not talking about just plain folks. Uh, we're talking about the type that would likely to run into each other at Bilderberg meetings. <laughs> Uh, you know, running the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Well, you know, in the interim, as, as we know, uh, it has grown from 12 members to 28 members, actually grew from 16 to 28 members. It's a 75% increase in the decade from 1999 to 2009. Uh, in the words of a uh, prominent uh, State Department official maybe 10 years ago, uh, he's boasting of it, of course, at the time. He said that at the end of the Cold War in 1990, or the, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, let's say in 1991, one, NATO had 16 members and no partners. And now, is he, at the time he was speaking, said it has 28 members and 40 some partners. He's correct. Uh, collectively, that's over 70 nations. It represents well over a third of the countries in the United Nations uh, that are either members of NATO or members of NATO partnership program, including Japan. And Japan, as a matter of fact, and we can get to that in a second, um, has. Uh, had traditionally been a member of what were called contact countries with NATO, and there were four of them initially. They were Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, South Korea, and uh, Japan. So they were members of, former members of military blocs, with the exception of Japan for obvious reasons, that were created in the Cold War period after the model of NATO. You know, for example, the um, Australia-New Zealand uh, Treaty Organization 
ANZUS really, and uh, but also the CENTO and the CETO, the Central Treaty Organization and the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. You notice the identity of, of the names even, right? Uh, and they were all modeled after NATO. And uh, now what we see, however, in the post-Cold War period is an incorporation of the members of those other military blocs globally into one common command structure with NATO at the top, the U.S., of course, ordering all this. Uh, on the question of uh, you know Japan, it, a new step was made two years ago, where the uh, NATO ahead of the summit, NATO summit here in Chicago, NATO created something called, and uh, this term should uh, you know ring some bells with people, I would hope, uh, partners across the globe. Uh, of which there were initially eight, all of them uh, in the greater Asia-Pacific region from the Middle East to the South Pacific, uh, Japan being one of those uh, eight. So that's that's the background. But the uh, J- Japanese Prime Minister Abe um, actually went to NATO headquarters and uh, was <laughs> granted what's called Individual Partnership and Cooperation Program, which is part of the Partners Across the Globe arrangement. Uh, several other members, including Mongolia, incidentally, which borders both Russia and China, uh, has been granted a similar program under the Partners Across the Globe. So that gives you, you know, a thumbnail sketch of what global uh, NATO, in fact, um, you know, is. And uh, within that context, uh, we should remember that in Afghanistan, uh, NATO's first ground war, NATO's first war in Asia, uh, coming up now on its um, the 13th anniversary of it, of its, uh, of it being launched, The uh, International Security Assistance Force, which was turned over to NATO about a decade ago, uh, includes or has included troops from over 50 countries and from every inhabited continent. The, uh, if you will, unofficial NATO partner is uh, one of one of the uh, two of the unofficial NATO partners, uh, El Salvador in Central America and Colombia in South America. That would give NATO a military presence on every continent except Antarctica. Well, as always, that's just a stunning um, stunning summary when you put it all together like that. And I hope that really does help to connect some of the dots for people who still perhaps think of NATO as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It truly is a global organization right now with the ability to deploy basically anywhere in the world. And unfortunately, of course, as I say, we are speaking at, on uh, during a time of crisis in Eastern Europe that does bring the NATO countries very much into play. And we have to be looking at what's happening there. So... Let's just turn again to the front page of Stop NATO International right now, where you have such t- uh, headlines as Russia's Northwest Border, 6,000 troop NATO war games with warplanes, warships, U.S. NATO interceptor missiles aimed at Russia, U.S. Canada lead military exercises in Poland. Obviously, again, the military tensions in that area are, are just ramping up. But of course, this is only the end point of a process that's been happening for many years now. Perhaps you can take us back to the fall of the Soviet Union and take us forward to the present time to talk a little bit about NATO's expansion into Eastern Europe and into the former backyard of the Soviet Union. Yeah, thanks once again, James, for uh, you know, as striking, I hope, as those headlines are, the ones you just read off. And, you know, they're only uh, a pretty good sampling, I meant. Uh, you exercise good judgment selecting the ones you did. Uh, however, I mean, if you continue to scroll down, you'll find any number of others comparable to them. And they are striking precisely because we now have, we now witness um, the, the, the very real prospect, the horrifying prospect of a direct military confrontation between the U.S.-led military bloc, NATO, the U.S. itself, directly, and on one hand, and Russia on the other. In other words, a direct military confrontation between the world's two nuclear superpowers, nothing less. And uh, so the, the headlines uh, you've read now, uh, I think, signify to anyone hearing them uh, just how dangerous the situation this truly is. And there has been a marked level of escalation we can talk about in a moment. But to be frank with you, uh, for 15 years we've been documenting this buildup in Eastern Europe along the entire western flank of Russia from the Arctic Ocean down to the Baltic Sea and really into the Co- South Caucasus. This has been a slow, methodical, but inexorable process of... Uh, you know, absorbing more and more Eastern European nations into NATO directly as full members or incorporating them through the Partnership of Peace and other arrangements as partners. Sometimes being a partner is sufficient for U.S. interests. And then, uh, you know, moving military personnel and hardware into those countries. This includes air bases, naval bases, missile uh, installations, radar bases. 
uh, training facilities and, and so forth, uh, about which again we can talk. But uh, from the very beginning, no, um, you know, the Soviet Union had fragmented into its 15 federal republics in 1991. In the same year, uh, the the Warsaw uh, Pact, which is technically it was technically the Warsaw Treaty Organization, again to show the uh, you know the model of names. Uh, formed six years after NATO and in response to NATO not being formed but absorbing West Germany into into the alliance, um, that immediately um, the United States uh, decided, and I think this is a very important fallacy to put to rest right now, NATO is not a Cold War relic looking for a mission. As, as we hear from a lot of well-meaning people sometimes, James, it is not a uh, slumbering, bumbling, um, you know, uh, uh, obtuse uh, creature looking for some place to eat or something. Uh, it has been recrafted very consciously, deliberately, and all too effectively by the United States after the, the end of the Cold War into what it now is a global war-fighting machine, which has launched and conducted unprovoked wars in three continents in Southeast Europe, in South Asia, in North Africa, in the last case, of course, with Libya two years, two years ago. So, you know, uh, three years ago. So we, uh, we now know, uh, you know, any, any comment about, uh, you know, U.S. is invested in NATO and it's good for making profits uh, for the merchants of death, which is true. Uh, but that's not the sole purpose for it. The U.S. has, as I mentioned, refashioned it uh, to gain ultimately a global military control. If that began in the early 1990s by, as, as, as we had some occasion to talk about briefly before, uh, creating partnership programs that were new to NATO, the biggest one being the Partnership for Peace, what an Orwellian, uh, you know, appellation. And uh, that immediately uh, incorporated the, the uh, 12 new NATO members uh, um, were groomed, if you will, by the Partnership for Peace for full NATO membership. Those are Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, those three being former Soviet republics, Slovenia and Croatia, former federal republics of uh, Yugoslavia, Albania, Bulgaria, Romania. Uh, you know, if you're looking on a map in uh, in your mind's eye, you can see that then from the Baltic Sea all the way down to the Black Sea, that's the entire. Uh, it's every former member of the Warsaw Pact, uh, um, except for Soviet republics, excepting Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. That gives you some idea. I believe George W. Bush actually made a comment after the biggest round of NATO expansion in 2004, a decade ago, in Istanbul, Turkey, where seven members were absorbed for the first time, including those three former Soviet Baltic republics, we made a statement to the effect that the Warsaw Pact is now NATO. And um, to complement that, a Russian official on the 20th anniversary of the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 2009 made a statement that the Berlin Wall, in fact, has been reassembled and uh, reconstructed along the entire western border of Russia. And symbolically, if not in fact, that's the truth. So what NATO went to work doing in the 1990s was fashioning a number of, the, of partnership programs. A partnership for Peace to this day includes some 23 nations. They are all the former Soviet republics, excluding Russia, that aren't already in NATO, the three Baltic states. They are um, all every country in Europe that is not a, a full member of NATO. And I, I want to underline that. And this, uh, with Cyprus uh, presumably being in the process now of being absorbed into partnership for peace, of some 39 uh, nations in Europe, James, excluding so called micro states like Andorra, Vatican City. Uh, and Liechtenstein and so forth, that uh, of the 39 states, every single one of them is either a member of NATO or a member of a NATO partnership program. And this includes, until recently, Russia with the uh, um, NATO-Russia Council. That presumably is in abeyance. So now we have one nation out of 39 that is not a NATO partner or a member. Uh, but this shows complete subordination of a, of a continent, of the richest continent in the world, probably, uh, you know, under the thumb of the U.S.-dominated military alliance. Other military partnerships that are formed very early on in the 90s include the Mediterranean Dialogue, which took in uh, initially seven nations in North Africa and the Middle East, Israel, Jordan, uh, Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Mauritania. Uh, Libya, since it was attacked and destroyed by NATO, is now a candidate for the Mediterranean Dialogue. There's no doubt in my mind that in Brussels uh, they're planning to bring Syria and Lebanon into that uh, military partnership as soon as they, you know, it, should they succeed in overthrowing the government in Syria and so forth. So this is the beginning of the process of global expansion. It occurred immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
Well, that is a very thorough itemization of what's what's been going on there for the past couple of decades, encroaching further and further directly onto the border of Russia, as you say. And of course, that brings up the question of Ukraine itself. What is its status with NATO exactly? What kind of uh, program, partnership program has it been involved with? And uh, and what what is uh, what is likely to be be happening at this particular point? Ukraine is the first member, uh, was the first member of the Commonwealth of Independent States, and this is a small distinction, I won't make too much of it, but when the 15 federal republics of the Soviet Union became independent in 1991, three of them, you know, given their history, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, decided not to join the Commonwealth of Independent States, which uh, was a common trade and economic, is a common trade and economic bloc, if you will, former Soviet republics, comparable at that time in 1991, say, to the European community, now European Union. Uh, Ukraine was the first of those tw- of the 12 members of the Commonwealth of Independent States to be granted the Partnership for Peace status. So it was clear that Ukraine was uh, selected as the first former Soviet Republic, excluding the Baltic states, uh, to, be in- to be integrated into NATO in some manner just to give us an historical perspective on it. Uh, you know, immediately afterwards, the U.S. started conducting annual war games, several of them actually, uh, in Ukraine, the largest of which was in Crimea. It, it's called, they were called Seabreeze. They were held annually. They were multinational NATO Partnership for Peace war games held at uh, St. Femeral, uh, which is only you know, a few uh, kilometers away from uh, Sevastopol, where the Russian Black Sea Fleet is, ba- is, Black sea fleet is based. And uh, 2000, no, it was 1,600, 1,700 Ukrainian troops were sent to Iraq under the uh, Leonid Kuzma government in, uh, you know, a court um, in expectation of Partnership for Peace NATO uh, obligations. They served in the um, multinational force Iraq, in the South Central Division, which is basically headed up by Poland and supported by NATO. A lot of your listeners, I'm sure, don't realize NATO's role in, in Iraq. Uh, that's a, a topic for another discussion, perhaps. But uh, subsequent to that, just in recent years, and by the way, you know, as much of a demon as they've tried to make, uh, you know, deposed, legitimate, elected, uh, internationally recognized until recently, uh, head of state and president of the country, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, uh, is being portrayed in the West. Uh, He bent over backwards to accommodate NATO in almost every way imaginable. The Seabreeze exercises, incidentally, in Crimea had to be uh, canceled one year because of mass protest locally. He went ahead and, uh, you know, forced those exercises back on the Crimeans, you know, for several years in succession. He became the, uh, he made Ukraine the first country to um, allot a warship to NATO's, and again, I don't know how many of your listeners know this, to NATO's permanent uh, naval uh, surveillance and, and interdiction operation in the Mediterranean Sea, Operation Active Endeavor. It's been, a, you know, it's part of the Article 5 War Clause of NATO that was invoked after 9-11 in the United States, which accounts for NATO being in Afghanistan, but also accounts for this unprecedented NATO operation in the Mediterranean. Ukraine then uh, almost immediately afterwards donated a, a warship to NATO for its copper war operation off the Horn of Africa, um, uh, which is... Uh, and actually goes uh, throughout the Arabian Sea into the Indian Ocean, where, you know, within uh, the last year or so, a uh, NATO vessel killed two Indian fishermen or so, so forth. It's called Operation Ocean Shield. Uh, NATO, uh, the Ukraine was to be one of, you mentioned NATO, uh, you know, operating around the world. Uh, they have certain uh, mechanisms created for precisely that, uh, you know, purpose, uh, rapid reaction force and so forth, but primarily the NATO response force, of which four non-NATO members had been invited to join and were in the process of joining. They are Ukraine, Georgia, Finland, and Sweden. So time and again, you see the centrality of, of uh, Ukraine for a number of reasons. The fact that it has both uh, water and sea borders combined, uh, you know, abuts Russia, you know, maybe 1,400 kilometers. I think maybe it's 1,400 miles, come to think of it. Uh, so it has a very long border comparable to that of Finland, which, by the way, is the next one. Uh, we can talk about, you know, to totally um, encase and enclose and uh, besiege Russia from the West. Uh, Ukraine and Finland are the two key countries, and they're both being worked on simultaneously. Um, you know, in terms of, and again, by NATO integration, I don't necessarily mean full NATO membership. I don't even know that the U.S. wants that in many cases. Though we have to say that at the uh, recently concluded two-day conference of the U.S. Atlantic Council, and if, uh, you know, people don't know what the Atlantic Council is, please Google it. 
if you want to know who's really running your world and your country, and, and if there is a nuclear conflict, heaven for a friend, you know, between Russia and the United States, who has planned it, uh, you at least have the right to know who's uh, you know, trifling with your life in this manner, and the Atlantic House is right at the top of it. Um, there, was, there was a video posted on the site after the two-day conference, which was called, by the way, Europe Free and Whole. And uh, for a moment, I, it, this is not uh, too arcane or obscure, I think, and that uh, expression was first used in 1989 in Mainz, uh, Germany, by George H.W. Bush, then president, where in a speech he used the expression Europe Whole and Free, actually. And that's the name of the conference of the Atlantic Council. A variation of that is Europe Whole, Free, and at Peace. Pay attention to when you hear that and by whom. That is a code, code phrase. It is, uh, I believe, from 1989 onward, uh, the code phrase for the um, you know, consolidation of a unified Europe uh, controlled by Brussels, but on behalf of the United States. Uh, not only a militarized Europe, as I mentioned, where the entire uh, European continent and its uh, island offshoots are under the control of the U.S.-dominated military bloc, but where you have a totalitarian economic and political system enforced from Brussels as well. At any rate, at that uh, conference at the Atlantic Council, so uh, an award was given to Chuck Hagel, Joe Biden spoke, John Kerry spoke, um, uh, the uh, Barroso from the European Union to show how much difference there is between NATO and the EU uh, was given an award and so forth. But uh, John Kerry's comments in particular were, were frightening. That's, he said that the U.S. and its NATO allies would defend Ukraine. That's a, virtually a quote. And that uh, uh, the U.S. is committed to defending every square inch of NATO territory. And he said what's happening in, in Europe right now is a threat to the entire system of global uh, the entire model of global leadership. I think he let the cat out of the bag because he was speaking to fellow initiates. And he was indicating by uh, the model of global leadership, he meant the U.S. dominated one in the post-World War II period, but I think more because he's speaking to the Atlanticist or Euro-Atlantic community, is he's talking about you know the potential emergence of a multipolar world that might displace 500 years of Western domination of the globe. Nothing less than that is involved. That is, I mean, that is absolutely phenomenal. And for people who don't understand the significance of Secretary of State John Kerry saying something like that, um, let's flesh that out. Because again, we're talking about these these global partners for peace and the individual partnership and cooperation program and all of these other organizations and uh, offshoots of, of NATO that that uh, that all of these various members across the globe are joining up to. And it does sound quite ominous, but it does raise the question: What does that actually mean um, in 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 real terms uh, for? For example, of course, he raised the, uh, the the topic of Article Five, which is commonly known as the uh, Collective Self Defense Clause, but I think you called it the War Clause, which is a, a much more accurate phrase, whereby, of course, uh, NATO uh, countries swear to defend the the territory uh, from any attack on any one of the NATO members. But of course, that's for full mem- members, isn't it? Um, does this apply to partners? Uh, what are the actual obligations if a if a partner of NATO is attacked or, or comes under threat? That's uh, debatable and debated. Uh, as a matter of fact, when they were alleged cyber attacks, and there may indeed have been cyber attacks, but cyber attacks in Estonia in 2008, which, of course, the Estonian government headed up by an American. I don't know if people know this. You know, Tumas Elvis, their president, was raised in New Jersey. Um, I don't need, if he speaks Estonian, that's amazing, but I'm sure he does with an American accent. But then he... Uh, dutifully and predictably uh, requested assistance from the, the United States and NATO because they were NATO members since 2004, um, that uh, there was discussion amongst uh, you know the usual uh, cast of uh, interventionists like John McCain, Lindsey Graham, and so forth, about extending Article 5 protection to NATO partners, to use it for cyber crimes, for energy security, uh, so you know, stretching the the uh, boundaries, um, you know, increasing the elasticity of uh, NATO production under Article Five. This also came up in the same year, 2008, when uh, Georgia precipitated a war with Russia by invading South Ossetia, and Georgia, a NATO partner but not member. Um, you know, uh, appealed for NATO assistance, and there was active debate, you know, particularly within the United States, uh, about extending Article 5 protection to non-NATO members. We'll see how that works. But yeah, again, keep in mind the statement I just cited by uh, Kerry, where he said NATO and all its members will defend the Ukraine. Uh, you know, he cannot, uh, properly speaking, you're correct, invoke Article but he can certainly come up with some uh, equivalent or analog thereof. And I suspect that's what's going on right now. But let's look at the military buildup in Eastern Europe. 
the U.S. has sent uh, 600 airborne uh, rapid reaction combat troops to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. Uh, it is now rotating F-16 planes, I believe two squadrons, perhaps 18 planes collectively, that traditionally had operated out of the Aviano Air Base in Italy. Now they're going to be permanently rotated uh, through Poland. U.S. has taken over two major air bases in Poland, the uh, Losk and Vodic bases. They've had a base since 2004. NATO's fl flown regular air patrols out of Lithuania. They've now activated an, a base in Estonia. They're working on one in Latvia. Uh, uh, in 2008 and 2009, Condoleezza Rice went to respectively Romania and Bulgaria and signed agreements to uh, to employ, really to take over, eight military bases, including three major air bases and naval bases in those two countries. Uh, th those bases were used for the wars uh, you know, in Afghanistan, for the war against Libya, less so. Uh, this is what has been uh, you know, occurring in the last few years. Well, people, I'm afraid, sadly, oftentimes distracted themselves with minutia or tangential issues. Well, the steady buildup. I'm, I'm stressing this fact because the way that things are presented in the West, I don't have to tell you or your listeners, is, is one of... Um, uh, irrespe matters irrespective of, of context, of course, how things are decontextualized. And in fact, a not uncommon manipulation of, of information is that of reversing both um, uh, 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 causality, you know, what causes which, and um, um, the sequence of events. So that we're now told that the U.S. and the NATO is building up in Eastern Europe uh, because of an alleged Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has never occurred, of course. Uh, that's a that's a fantasy. Uh, whereas, in fact, you know, the Russian response may, in very large part, uh, you know, be related to the fact that the U.S. has has moved its military, including interceptor missiles, um, you know, directly into countries that directly border Russia. We have to recall, four years ago, the U.S. for the first time moved in what presumably are permanent interceptor missiles into the Polish city of Morag, which is only some 40 miles from Russian territory, the uh, province of Kaliningrad. And these are, you know, fairly advanced, Patriot Advanced Capability 3 um, missile segment enhancer uh, missiles that have a far longer range than Patriots formerly had. But this is preparatory, of course, to next year, moving 24 standard missile 3 interceptors into Romania, and possibly three years later, a similar, the same amount into Poland, as well as deploying um, guided missile destroyers and cruisers with interceptor missiles, some of which have been going in and out of the Black Sea regularly as of late. But, but Rick, that, that's for Iran. That's not for Russia. Oh, North Korea. <laughs> oh, no, North Korea. Sorry, sorry, I got my boogeyman mixed up. Um, I mean, the, the Secretary General of uh, NATO, Anders Fogg Anders, uh, Anders Rasmussen, you know, would say that. And actually, up until recently, he included a third country as the threat of Europe. That country was Syria that Syria somehow presented a strategic missile threat to Europe and North America. This is right, you know, Google it. Uh, he talked about something like, I forget how many countries now possess ballistic missiles and pose a threat to, uh, you know, the free nations and democratic nations of the world, world security, what have you. And he would regularly cite, in addition to uh, the White Houses and Pentagons and State Departments, uh, you know, the evil du duel, duo, uh, North Korea and Iran, Syria as being the third. So, you know, you can see, you know, when they target somebody, they give you an advance warning who they're going after. It, it's just beyond imagination how th this can, this kind of rhetoric can be used and believed by anybody, but perhaps it's not even necessarily meant to be believed. It's just uh, meant for show. Um, of course, you raised the specter of NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen, the, the public face of NATO, and as repulsive as that public face may be, of course, I don't believe that's where uh, a lot of the power or decision-making necessarily lies. And you did raise the, uh, the specter of the Atlantic Council. Perhaps you can talk about, um, in the event of of actual military confrontation in in Ukraine or or along that uh, that area, who would be the people who would be in charge of what's happening? Who would be the decision makers in this process? Who are the people that we should be keeping our eye on? That's a good question. Uh, the you know, uh, formally the highest uh, decision making body in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is. Uh, um, I'm just going to call it the Atlantic Council, but it's very similar. North Atlantic Council. And the North Atlantic Council uh, consists of the ambassadors of the respective NATO member states, so there'd be 28 of them. Uh, up, uh, during the George W. Bush administration, by the way, at, at least part of that administration, the U.S. ambassador to NATO was none other than Victoria Nuland. 
Um, until recently, with the uh, Obama administration, it was uh, Netherlands-born Evo Dalder, who now heads up the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, uh, until recently called the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations. So you see, again, the... Um, you know, um, what, what term do I want to use? The coterminous or overlapping uh, nature of think tanks, State Department, uh, military, NATO. I mean, they're all one in, in the same elite club. Uh, but the actual military decisions would be turned over to the military committee of NATO, which has held, I, I think this is another frightening, frightening fact, has held in recent years, in the last two years, three years, say, meetings of the mil- extended meetings of the military committee that included partners and so forth, including what they call, uh, they know by the acronym CHOD, C-H-O-D-S, Chiefs of Defense Staff, which is really the equivalent of the U.S. Uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, say, uh, has held meetings with 65 Chiefs of Defense Staff, that is a third of the nations in the world, at NATO headquarters, if you want to get a, a nightmare image of a global military bloc, I don't know what better than that, what I've just cited you in that regard. Uh, but let's look, uh, just step back a moment. <clears throat> just as NATO has exploited uh, Turkey's bordering Syria as a way of deploying interceptor missiles there, we know that there are Patriot Advanced Capability 3 missile batteries in the United States, Netherlands, and Germany in Turkey, this time apparently permanently. Uh, equivalents thereof <clears throat> were sent to Turkey by NATO in 1991 and again in 2003, ahead of the two attacks against Iraq. But this time they've been there, I think, 18 months, and probably closer, closer on two years, and they're just never disappearing. Because Rasmussen, again, repeatedly identifies Turkey as, and I quote him, NATO's southeastern border. And NATO's southeastern border, I would add, not only with Syria, but of course with Iraq and Iran, but the purpose there is to, almost to position a NATO member uh, in a conflict area so that it, it, the perpetrator of aggression, a potential one, can be portrayed as the victim. And then you can talk about Article 4 and Article 5 provisions about NATO intervening. The missiles in Turkey are there right now under NATO's Article 4 provision, which is uh, you know, kind of the lead into Article 5, as numerically it, it would be suggested now, that if a NATO member is in a position where it feels under threat, it could ask for assistance. So that's why the you know the Dutch, German, and uh, U.S. missiles are in, are in Turkey right now. Um, of course, the next step logically would be for Turkey to uh, uh, go to Brussels and say, uh, you know, Syria lobbed a, a mortar shell or something across the border. We've been attacked. We want all of NATO to come down in Syria. That's not an unlikely possibility. A comparable situation obtains in Eastern Europe right now. At the point where Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, not on their own initiative, I can assure you, but on, you, on the prompting of the respective U.S. ambassadors says, Russia threatens us. Then uh, NATO can invoke Article 5 and go to war against Russia. I don't have to tell your listeners what that means. No, you don't. But I think, again, this is uh, extremely important, but it can be extremely overwhelming when we look at it in the abstract. And I think it's important that we concentrate on some of the things that are actually happening there. And on that note, of course, you did post uh, just the other day an appeal for surviving victims of Odessa massacre, talking about the the massacre that occurred in Odessa at the trade union's house on on May 2nd. Um, Let's talk about that incident and and the information that you got uh, about that and posted on Stop NATO International. Yeah, this is very difficult to talk about. Uh, I, um, you know, discovered the incident uh, on Friday afternoon, and and uh, then Saturday morning somebody sent me what a uh, twenty-five minute videotape. I assume you and most people have seen by now. It's it's clearly taken by a you know it's a cell phone video taken by one of the I don't know what term do you use for creatures like this thugs monsters beast uh, who are outside the trade uh, union's house and uh, have at this time already chased the. Um, you know, I would call them not only a federalist, but pro-democracy, anti-fascist, um, you know, a peaceful protesters into the building preparatory to blockading it and burning it to the ground and killing all those inside. And what you see in that 25-minute tape, and this is what I had seen on uh, Saturday morning, is uh, them, you know, carefully constructing or putting together Molotov cocktails, you know, petrol bombs petrol bombs, and having uh, Odessa police officers walk by and kind of, uh, you know, give them a th- thumbs up, like a good job, boys. And uh, one fellow, a heavyset fellow, a man maybe in his 30s or 40s with the uh, police-style bulletproof vest firing a handgun, you know, openly. This is all over the Internet. Nobody can dispute this. And uh, then you see the actual Molotov cocktails being hurled, uh, you know, very deliberately. Somebody climbing up on the ledge of a building, say, on the you know, second floor and throwing them in the window and setting them fire and so forth. So at any rate, I mean, 
the indisputable facts are that uh, you know Pravi sector, right sector, and other neo-Nazi uh, uh, groups uh, and uh, you know soccer yobs or you know what what not uh, you know out there uh, drunk for all I know, and they perpetrate this horrific crime, and not a word issues from the West, not a word from the Western media, not a word from the human rights organizations uh, generously funded by, uh, you know, God knows whom in the West, including the U.S. government. Uh, this uh, atrocious, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, Russian officials, and this is something where it's a pity we don't know more about the rest of the world, um, you know, refer to this as a new Khatim, a K-H-A-T-Y-N, uh, which is a city in Belarus. That happens to be where my paternal grandfather uh, was born and raised, and, uh, you know, I had relatives there before the War. We never heard from them afterwards. I assume they were killed. One out of four uh, residents of Belarus were killed by the Nazis. But Katyn was the worst massacre. And the typical Nazi technique in uh, Belarus was around everybody in a village or a town up into a building and set it afire. So the illusion, you know, to anyone who's lived in the former Soviet Union, they know what that means. And they know who perpetrated it last time, and they know who perpetrated it this time. But there was a comment finally by the ordinarily, you know, very reserved uh, foreign minister of Russia, uh, Sergei Lavrov, who said yesterday that uh, the, the Ukrainian government is, co is uh, uh, back, or siding with neo-Nazis against its own people. This is almost a quote from the foreign minister of Russia, saying that in the current military onslaught in eastern Ukraine, as well as what occurred in Odessa, that the Ukrainian regime, you can't call it a government, it wasn't elected, it's not legitimate, um, it came to power by brutal means, it maintains its power by brute means, uh, it has launched a military offensive in eastern Europe, the, in eastern Ukraine, Ukraine, rather, that by some accounts includes 15,000 troops, several hundred armored vehicles, including tanks, field artillery, attack helicopters against civilians. I mean, this is unspeakable. If this were to occur in any other country, you know, they could uh, claim that the Syrian government was doing something uh, similar to this would be crimes against humanity and, and so forth. But uh, the, there is not, I mean, I uh, ask anyone who hears the show eventually to mention one prominent Western official who's had a word to say negatively about this, who hasn't in fact been cheering this on as what it's described as being uh, by the fascist junta in Kiev, an anti-terrorist operation burning down a building, apparently a trade union headquarters, and killing at least 46 people. There's a city councilman in Odessa yesterday who estimates 162 killed. Uh, as an anti-terrorist operation uh, carried out by whom? By people with swastika armbands. And as harrowing as that information is, it's equally harrowing, or, or perhaps even more so, to think that if the tables were turned, and this could be painted as some sort of Russian aggression, then we would perhaps be on the uh, brink of war as NATO, as you painted uh, the, the picture before, that NATO is already prepared to step in to defend Ukraine. So um, again, we are on such a knife edge, and it's something that I am definitely concerned about, as I am, imagine my listeners are, and I hate to leave conversations on this note of unmitigating uh, 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 just horror. So I, I, I want to ask if there are any countervailing forces, anything that you see that could step us back from this brink, anyone or anything working within the system against this war agenda, or anything on the horizon that, that the people can actually get behind to try to stop what's happening right now. Yeah, perhaps there is, and I'll, I'll briefly allude to what I think. You know, could be global forces, and maybe even some internally in the United States. But let me, uh, you know, state that I'm a child of the Cold War. Uh, you know, my christening was the McCarthy period and the Korean War. I was born during the Korean War. Uh, there was no question. I think historians have, you know, have evaluated this accurately, but that the Cold War and the Red Scare and so forth were launched precisely to whip the country, the United States, into shape, not only for the Korean War, but in for the long haul, including the Cold War, and ultimately perhaps a nuclear war with, uh, with Soviet Russia. There's no question that, the, you know, first you have to uh, stifle all dissent and all political expression preparatory to something like that. That is exactly what has happened in the United States. I have said before, and I'll say again, and I know some of the people I'm talking about personally, but of the 435 members of the U.S. House of Representatives and the 100 members of the Senate, since Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich, Kucinich left the House after last term, there's not a single one who I, with any confidence, would believe, uh, believe would uh, uh, um, you know, denounce or oppose firmly any U.S. military action anywhere in the world. 
That is the kind of monolithic, uh, you know, control politically that exists in the United States. You 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 had some uh, you mentioned something about uh, you know how we could uh, motivate people, inform them, and activate them, and whether it would matter. The sad fact of the matter is we have a information totalitarian system. Information wise, we have a totalitarian system. Politically, absolutely. There is no uh, legitimate means for political expression in the United States. There are two parties who uh, control, uh, you know, the funding and the, and the ballot access and the access to the media and everything else necessary to wage a political campaign. Uh, when uh, Ralph Nader, for example, uh, 14 years ago, attempted a very spirited campaign endorsed by a lot of prominent politicians, his campaign was torpedoed. And they wanted to make sure that uh, never again can you have any political independence or, or variety or, uh, you know, the political expression in the United States. That's the bad news. The bad news is also in the post-Cold War period, the U.S. has managed to bribe, bully, and blackmail damn near every country in the world. Uh, when the vote came up for, on Crimea and the United Nations Security Council, I believe only 12 countries voted against it. That should send shudders down the spine of everyone on this planet. That one country has managed to, uh, you know, whip the the rest of the world into line like that. So we're up against some pretty formidable odds. Let's not fool ourselves. But uh, I think the the only saving grace is uh, it has been such a heavy-handed oppression and uh, suppression and repression here in the United States that some people who uh, are accustomed to be treating a, be, being treated a little bit more nicely than they have been of late are starting to squawk, including members of the elite. And they're not used to being told, uh, being told to shut up, and you're not coming back on television and so forth because you take an even-handed approach on Ukraine. And I can only hope that there'll be enough of this, um, you know, the Ray McGovern types or the, uh, you know, others who have spoken out in recent years, you know, who will come out and blow the whistle on this thing and wake people up. There's no question but that the American people have no stomach for, no interest in uh, a war over Ukraine. But as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the, what the American population thinks about anything is of the least concern uh, to the governing elite in this country and to the so-called elected representatives of the American people. Uh, the good news is if we defeat the war drive, we may also break the, the back of the totalitarian political system in the United States. Well, one can only hope. Uh, Rick Rosoff, I'm always taken aback by the clarity and the force of the information that you present, and I'm always grateful for that, even if these are not necessarily the most uplifting or happy uh, interviews that I conduct. They certainly are extremely important in this extremely tense time. That's why I am keeping an eye on Stop NATO International at rickrosoff.wordpress.com, and I hope other people will do so. Again, that will be linked up in the show notes for today's interview. Rick, thank you once again for your time. I do appreciate it. No, thank you, James.